Hello, this is uh, Dr. Mohammed, and this is another video under design of steel structures according to AISC. Uh, we are still talking about the compression members, and today we are going to talk about part four. The contents of today's video is going to be related to the effective length. I'm going to talk about uh, effective length more in depth, and then I'm going to take an uh, example. After that, I'm going to uh, mention about the approximate uh, effective length factor uh, and after that I'm going to uh, talk about the effective length moment uh, frames or effective length for moment uh, frames I mean that for the case of columns uh, this is the case where that we are having side sway permitted and I'm going to talk about the effective length of columns in case of the braised frames which is side sway not permitted Okay, now let's go to the next uh, slide. So actually here, uh, sorry, yes. as we said that we are going to talk about more about the uh, effective length. So before doing anything, we want to understand that whenever we have a column, as you can see here, we are like having two principal axes for this column. Okay, so these two principal axes, the column can buckle around any uh, or about any one of them. So if we have a compression member, okay, and this compression member, if a compression member is supported differently with respect to each, uh, to each of its principal, uh, principal uh, axes, the effective length will be different for the two directions. As you can see here, we have a column. This column is having X and Y axes. If you look to this column cross-section, which is I cross-section, it is going to buckle, if you look here, around Y axes. And the length here is going to be this length, which is the half of the column length, which is 12 feet, for example. And also here, we are having the second half of the column, which is another 12 feet here. So this means that our column is going to be as if it is going to be separated by this girder or this beam, and the effective length is going to be half. This is around Y. However, around X axis, you are going to find that the full length is going to work for us. So the two direction or, or the two directions, they are not the same. So this is how, or this is the x-axis buckling. You are going to find that the this column is going to buckle. Um, I, I was only giving the example that is half or half of the total length is going to work for us here. But actually, for this end conditions, the inflection point is going to be halfway through of the uh, first story, for example, and the second story. So we're going to find that the effective buckling length is going to be half okay it is like <clears throat> the distance between half of the upper story to or from the middle of the upper story to the middle of the lower story okay and this is how it will work for the y-axis okay we're going to find that <clears throat> the buckling length is going to be like less than even the, the half okay so this means that this is what I want to highlight here, that the effective length will be different for the two directions. This is something important to keep in our mind, that the buckling length will not be the same for uh, two different directions of the, co the column. Okay. <clears throat> Generally speaking, a rigid or fixed condition is very difficult to achieve. This is very true, because it is difficult actually to achieve the, uh, the fixed condition. Okay, in, in reality. Uh, actually, this is what how we can obtain if we are talking about like rigid uh, connection. We can obtain it by this kind of connection, but still full rigid, full fixed connection is very difficult to obtain. There is still some rotation is going to take place here. Okay. Unless some special provisions are made. So we can obtain the rigid or fixed connection or fixed condition. Uh, with under special provisions. 
Ordinary connections will usually closely approximate a hinge or pin connection. This means that the most common one is like hinge or pin. Actually, in reality, we are not going to achieve this, uh, these ideal cases or these ideal conditions, which is related to the rigid or fully fixed or fully hinged. We are, we are somewhere in between. So we are going to be like partially fixed, for example. But again, to make it easy for us to for calculations and formulas and so on, we are going to assume like fully hinge or fu fully fixed. And here we are going to talk about the uh, pin and conditions. Okay, this is the common case that we are going to deal with. Unless that we have a frame, for example, then the connection is going to be or the condition of the end condition is going to be judged by the flexural stiffness of this girder with respect to the column stiffness as we are going to see later okay so this is a an example for the rigid connection this is an example of the pin connection as you can see in reality you are going to find it here this is the rigid or fixed connection this is like a base of a column as you can see very heavy and seems that really we are maintaining or putting the special provisions as we said here which is like increasing the column uh, base and putting very huge like anchor bolts here and with the stiffeners and so on so this yes this gives to us maybe a fully fixed connection on the other hand we can have some case like this which has related to the hinge or pin connection as you can see it is allowed to rotate here it is allowed to rotate okay now let's go to the next <clears throat> slide look to this figure and this is what i was talking actually about in the beginning okay when i was like referring to this and saying like half and half and so on actually it doesn't apply uh, directly here but here we are going to understand what i meant by this if we have a column as you can see here this column is like uh, that is uh, like uh, supported uh, at uh, halfway through or in the middle or in this floor at this level of the floor we're going to find that the column length is divided okay with 13 feet each and we are going to symbolize this uh, beam or these girders or these beams with like pin connection here so the buckling wave of the column is we if we assume that it is hinged at the top and hinged at the bottom then the buckling length as you can see going to be like uh, kl of the this length is going to be half of the total length of the column so effective length is going to be 13 feet if we're talking about the column because the column is say that this is the web these are the two flanges here okay this is how we can see this. so we are having something here and here which is these these girders or these columns they are supporting the lateral displacement of the column on this direction or in this direction we call this minor axis buckling which is going to be kl going to be 13 feet However, here <clears throat> around the major, around the major, okay, uh, major axis buckling, you are going to find that the column is free to buckle from here to here, from the top here to the bottom foundation, as you can see. And we have the column is going to be this is the column here, okay. So this means that it is it is supported here and here. But however, here and uh, around the strong axis, the buckling length is going to be double or we can say 13 feet with uh, adding on them another uh, 13 feet which is the total length okay the total length because we do not have any lateral lateral support here so it is as if that we are having pen pen connection and uh, the total length kl is going to be 26 feet okay so this is if we're talking about y shape this it was a wide shape here is used as a column and is braised by horizontal members in two perpendicular directions at uh, top here these members prevent translation of the column these members we're talking about these members they are not going to allow the member or the column to go laterally
okay in all directions so it is like controlling it to go in this direction and also like perpendicular to the white screen or this screen okay these members prevent translation again of the of the column in all directions but the connections these connections we didn't mention about the details now about this connection permit small rotations to take place that's the point here as long as there is a permission for sm small rotations to to take place this means that we are going to resemble this connection as pin connection under these conditions the member can be treated as pin connected at the top as we said here it is pin connected at the top for the same reasons the connection to the support at the bottom may also be treated as a pin connected so here this is a pin connected as well or pin connection okay so again as we said many times we cannot control we cannot control the rotation even that we are putting some <clears throat> details for it but we cannot control the rotation here we are going to assume that it's pen pen connections okay now let's have an example about what we have uh, discussed up till now so let's assume that we have a wide flange 12 by 58 24 feet long as you can see column okay and it is pinned at both ends pinned here and pinned here as well in the weak direction at the third point so it is like pinned sorry it is pinned at the top and bottom and that which is like around x direction and around y direction it is like connected or in the weak or braised in the weak direction at the third point means that one third of the length is like laterally supported here and laterally laterally supported here if we're going to look to it as 3d or isometric you are going to find that we have this is x-axis for example and we have this is y-axis okay and then the rotation around this strong axis around x-axis okay is going to be or the buckling length or L is going to be 24 the unsupported length is going to be 24 feet however that around Y axis it is going to be one third one third one third here because we have like like uh, support here or lateral support here which is like uh, resembled here by these pen uh, pen support or the hinge supports here so we are going to check both directions so we have okay we have the cross section is wide flange and we know it we know all the properties of this uh, section we know the length and we know the yield a field it is a field equal to 50 ksi and we want the available compressive strength the available compressive strength so first of all we are going to calculate the slenderness ratio kl over r okay around x axis and around y axis the weak and the strong axes are going to be calculated so we have kx times l kx here is 24 to the total length around the strong axis x axis okay so here if we have this is like x for example here and if we have this is the weak axis which is y so k x which is 24 times 12 k here it is 1 because we are talking about pen pen connection so we have k equal to 1 over rx equal to 5.28 from where this is from exactly from the dimensions and properties table so stop the video now and go to the tables check this value after that you're going to check the other direction around y ky also it is 1 here because still we are talking about pen pin okay so it is pen pen so we have 8 times 12 this is for the conversion from foot to inch and then this is r y go to the table dimensions and properties table for this cross section wide flange 12 by 58 and check these values then we're going to find that our kx over l uh, kxl over rx is larger than ky over l can you imagine so the strong axis is going to be vulnerable okay this means that larger value controls 
For LRFD, we are going to use table 422. If you do not know about the tables, please revisit the, the previous two videos and you are going to understand um, uh, quite well about this table, okay? Because we have explained it in detail before. Then KL over R, it is 54.5, which is the larger one that we're going to use here. And from the table, you are going to find that VC times FCR, it gives us 32.24 KSI. Please also go now and stop the video and check this value. Based on this, our nominal strength, <clears throat> our nominal strength PN times phi C or phi C, it is going to be phi C times FCR area gross, which is going to be 17 so 36.24 okay which is this value already we have times area gross it is 17 also this is from the table go and check it from the table then you are going to find that this is the the design strength for lrfd it is going to be 616 kips okay so now what we can get from this uh from this example simply that we need to check both direction and in our case it was as we are expecting that the uh, the weak axis was not vulnerable however that the strong axis was vulnerable okay so the design strength was controlled by the buckling length around the strong axis not the weak axis okay okay now let's go to the another example and we are going to use available strengths from the tables using rx okay this is using rx why rx because commonly our tables are we are using ry so here we are going to check how to use the tables if we want to check for kx sorry kx okay kx lx over rx Okay, so we want to check about this, how we can use the table or the tables in this case. Okay. So I'm going to explain about, about this right now, and I'm going to talk about the rationale behind it. So the available strengths given in the column load tables, column load tables, okay? We have explained about this in the last video. Please go and check this uh these tables in the previous videos are based on the effective length with respect to y-axis as we said we're talking about y-axis whenever that we are uh, checking the um, the white flange or the cross section we are talking about the y-axis we have x-axis and y-axis okay so we are having uh, the the effective length with respect to y-axis a procedure for using the tables with KXL, however, can be developed by examining how the tabular values were obtained. So we are going to start with the value of KL. The strength was obtained by a procedure similar to the following. We put KL was divided by RY, which is related to the round Y, okay, or about Y. So it is, we have obtained KL over RY. Then we compute FCR, and after that, the available strength is phi C times PN for LRFD or PN over the omega for the ASD, right? That's, that's where or how we were using the tables, right? Thus, the tabulated strength are based on the values of KL being equal to KYL. That's right. This is what we use. This is the one of the conditions that we're using. If the capacity with respect to x-axis buckling is desired, is desired, the table can be entered with this value, which is kxl over the ratio between rx over ry. Take care of this. So we are going to obtain kx times l over the ratio. And the tabulated load will be based on, it is going to be kl over ry, which is this this equation here over ry okay this is ry and this is ry and the numerator here kl it is going to be what we have like assumed here then the output is going to be kxl over rx okay so how 
how what is the key here the key is we want rx over ry to be readily available so the ratio of rx over ry is given in the column load tables for each shape listed and if you remember that i have mentioned about this in the last video okay so rx over ry uh, is available in the table okay i think that we are ready now to take one example and check what we have uh, mentioned the compression member shown in figure 412 this is as you can see it here is pinned at both ends so it is bent at this end here and the bottom it is pinned and supported in the weak direction at mid height and supported at the weak direction at the mid height as you can see with this uh, this girder okay as you can see it here and here this is the beam that is being used to support the column in the weak direction a service load of 400 kips 400 kips with equal parts of dead and live load this means that dead is 200 and live load is 200 as well must be supported so use f yield equal to 50 ksi this is the yield of the steel cross section and select the lightest white flange shape so we are going to think about whenever we have a problem like this we need to think about the buckling length. What is the buckling length that we are going to use? Whether around the weak axis, okay, which is going to be nine, or around the like the strong axis, okay, which is going to be 18 feet double. So this means that we need to check both. We need to check both both so factored load in this case we start with the factored load because we want to start with like like one number in the beginning and then we are going to check others okay i mean that check the shapes available okay okay we want the lightest white flange shape so assume that that first of all the factored load is going to be 1.2 200 plus 1.6 200 because we are governed with gravity loading only no wind and no earthquake so we have 560 kips assume that the weak direction controls okay we're going to assume only this weak con direction controls and then we're going to check for the strong direction and enter the column and enter the column load tables with kl equal to nine feet so now stop the video and go to the tables okay with kl equal to nine feet okay and check first with the wide flange with eight okay eight um eight inch depth okay and check beginning with the smallest shapes we have this is wide flange with eight uh, depth with eight the first one found that will work for us is going to be wide flange eight by 58 with a design strength 634 again i have explained this many times in the last okay video and the last two last previous videos so please stop the video and go to the tables and check this value okay if you have no idea again i'm, I'm saying this again go to the previous two videos and check how we can obtain uh, this value from based on the tables now check the strong axis okay we have assumed here the weak direction now we are going to check the strong axis so it is going to be kx over kxl which is 18 because we have k here it is 1 because it is pen pen connection so we have here 18 over rx over ry 1.74 from where from the table it is given for us in the table so please check it also so now we have this new slenderness ratio is 10.34 okay okay or the effective length now for us is going to be 10.34 which is larger than nine feet right here we started with nine feet but when we check the strong axis we found that it is going to give us the equivalence of it is going to be 10.34 feet 
This means that Kx times L controls for this shape. That's right. This means that the strong direction okay, is going to be, the strong direction is going to control here. I mean that the effective length for it. Now enter the tables with KL equal to 10.34. Now already we found that the 9 was giving us this value, 634. But actually we are going to check for the real controlling value. Okay, the real controlling value. So we are going to check with 10.34. Enter the table again for white flanges and check how much strength is going to be available okay that is going to exceed exceed this 560 so when you enter the table with kl equal to 10.34 feet a wide flange 8 by 58 has an interpolated strength of yes 596 596 kips which is larger than 560 which is the original one that we were or the required strength right Okay, now remember how much this shape weight? It is 58, 58 pounds per foot. Remember that we are searching for what? Lightest. Okay, so now for wide flange with a depth of 8, we found that the lightest one that is going to work for, uh, for us, it is 58, okay? 58, okay. Now, let's investigate the white flange with nominal depth of 10. Try W10 by 49. Okay. Okay. With a design strength going to be 569. Why we, we chose this? Go to the table and you will understand why it is like this. Because this is the lightest shape that is going to provide a value of strength, design strength, that is larger than... 560 so we found that it is going to be 569 okay this is for what using what kl equal to what nine exactly now we are going to check this is we are assuming that kl with the weak axis is going to control right so now we are going to check what the strong axis which is kl around the strong axis and we, when we check it, KL over R, the slenderness ratio, it is going to be 18, as we have done before, over Rx over Ry from the table, it gives us 10.53. This means that we need to check, we need to check KL, okay, KL for having, or having 10.53, which is this value, the slenderness Okay, KL over R here. The slenderness ratio here is larger than a 9. This means that we need to use it. We need to use this new controlling slenderness ratio. Then what we are going to do? Exactly. We are going to enter the table with 10.53. Exactly. And then obtain, obtain the lightest white flange with nominal depth of 10 that is going to have design strength that is, let's go back again, yes, 560 or larger. So we want something to be 560 okay, or larger than this. So the lightest white flange 10, okay, with an interpolated design strength of 596, okay, which is larger than the required strength, is going to work for us. This is the lightest shape. With nominal depth of 10. Continue, con continue the search and investigate another white flange. We, we checked 8 nominal depth, 10, and then 12, and then we have 14, right? This is how we are going into the table, as we have mentioned before. Okay, so now we know about 8 and 10 already, and now we are going to for the 12. Continue the search and investigate white flange with 53. Okay, why 53? This is the lightest, the lightest cross section that is going to provide design strength 610, which is higher than the required strength, right? For KL, again, we start with KL9, always 9. And then we are going to investigate for the other strong 
axis or uh, direction. So kx times L, which is kx, and this is the strong around the strong axis, kx1, L is 18. Over the ratio, from the table, we can obtain the ratio from the column tables. You are going to find it 8.9. Okay, so now this is 8, sorry, 8.53. However, that this one, it is 9. So this means that 9 feet is going to control, not 8.93. So for the white flange with nominal depth of 12.5 uh, times 53, the, uh, the slenderness ratio around the weak axis is going to control. So we are going to have 610, our nominal design, sorry, our design strength for this cross section. So this means that KY times L controls for this shape and, and phi C times PN equal to 610 as we have obtained it before. Okay, so we're not going to use this. Definitely this, this uh, slenderness ratio is going to provide something, <coughs> uh, something that is going to be uh, like less, okay, less than 610. Okay, so I mean that this is the, the, uh, for 9 feet, this is the design strength that is corresponding to, to it. Okay, I mean that this uh, 9, because this is the, uh, this, is the uh, this is considered to be the slenderness ratio that is going to control. Okay, so if we have less, um, uh, like uh, slenderness ratio, this means that it might, uh, it is going to be different than this 610 and we need to, uh, not to consider it because this is the, this is the, uh, we can say, the critical uh, slenderness ratio that should be used. The critical slenderness, uh, the critical slenderness ratio that should be Okay, what I meant here, maybe I said that in, in a wrong way. Actually, whenever that we have less slenderness ratio, this means that the design strength is going to be higher. So we should check the slenderness ratio that is higher in order to get the lowest design strength. Okay, and then determine the lightest weight for W14. And as we said that we are going now to W14. The lightest one with a possibility of working is W14 by 61. Why? Because this is if we use 9 feet, 9 feet, we are going to find that it is heavier. Okay, it is going to provide, if we use the tables for 9 feet, it is going to give us 14 by 61. It is heavier than the lightest one found so far because all of what we have found, it was like in the range of 50s. Now for W14, we found that the lightest one, the lightest one for nine feet, for example, is going to be heavier than the previous ones. This means that 14 is not going to work for us. 14 is not going to work for us. So it is heavier than the lightest one found so far, so it will not be considered at all. This means that checking all the previous ones Let's go back here. We have 58. This is for nominal depth of 8. We have 54 for the nominal depth of uh, 10. And we have 53 for nominal depth of 12. So as you can see, the lightest one is white flange with nominal depth 12 by 53. And this is what we are going to use. Okay. So again, just recapping of what I have said here or what I have discussed in this uh, in this uh, uh, example we want the lightest white shape right so what we are going to do is simply we're going to check for 8 10 12 14 these are the nominal depths for white flange then we are going to use the table for each one of them and we are going to enter the table with Nine feet, nine feet first, which is the uh, weak axis buckling length. And then we are going to check it. Then we're going to check the, the other uh, like strong axis uh, slenderness ratio. OK, 
okay we're going to check the second if it gives us higher value than this nine this means that we are going to use the corresponding design strengths for this case if not then we're going to use the, de the design strengths corresponding to nine feet okay and the same for 10 the same for 12 and the same for 14 from all of these we are going to get the lightest one okay so this is what we have done exactly we started with white flange nominal depth 8 we found that 58 is going to work for us okay this is 58 i mean that it is the uh, the lightest shape that is going to provide the design strength we checked first nine feet okay so the nine feet gives us this 634 something kips here we found that the other one is going to provide us 10.34 larger than nine feet then kx strong axis would control when we checked it with 10.34 we found that it gives us 560 okay not 634 this is not the right one the cross section is going to fail by this one the cross section is going to fail by this one okay and then we have done the same for wide flange with nominal depth 10 and we found that uh, we are going to check first it's the slenderness ratio we found it 10.53 and based based on this it is larger than 9 so we're going to enter the table with 10.53 and then we are going to obtain the design strengths we checked it we found that the uh, lightest shape is going to be with 54 then we repeated the same procedure for nominal depth of 12 and we found that at this nominal depth the uh, strong axis slenderness ratio is less than 9 feet then nine feet would work for us from the table from the first trial which is this one and the weight here is 53 then uh, after that we checked for the case of 14 nominal dips of 14 and we found that it is going to give us very heavy cross section so we excluded it from the beginning we didn't check it and then our final lightest lightest cross section is going to be this white flange 12 by 53 okay now let's go to the next part which is related to the effective length for columns and continuous structure what i mean by the continuous structure is like if if you want to call it like frames for example yes you can call it something like this if we're talking about frames okay but continuous structure here means that any column that is part of like larger structure is considered to be one part of continuous structure we have many columns and we have many beams framing into one another and we want to understand more about it okay okay so now first of all i'm going to study like three different parts of this first is something related to the approximate effective length factor which is something like really it's approximate and it is going to be focusing on the end conditions only whether it is in a continuous structure or not whether it is like isolated or individual column or connected to uh, other uh, other other elements if we are sure about the end conditions like going to be fixed fixed for example 100 percent sure then we are going to use these approximate values for effective length factor k okay. okay without thinking about whether it is in continuous structure or not but we call it they call it like this isolated columns where that we know the end conditions very well okay so this is the buckled shape of the column okay which is shown in the dashed line here if we have hinge if we have fixed fixed so the theoretical k is going to be 0.5 However, what is recommended design value when ideal conditions are approximated is 0.65. means that we are always taking into consideration the ideal conditions, the reality conditions. Okay, This is the case of B, which is hinged, fixed, supposedly to be 0.7. Okay? And for guided, fixed, it is going to be 1. And for hinged, hinged, 
it is going to be one as well and here for free fixed is going to be two and for guided hinged is going to be two okay so this is the end condition code that we have used rotation fixed and translation fixed this is rotation free and translation fixed and this is rotation fixed here and translation free and the last one it is like pan rotation free and translation free as well okay so this is you can find this table as c dash c 2.2 okay in the specification you can find it for isolated columns that are not part of a continuous frame okay if we, if we say this is isolated column okay which is not part of continuous frame or if it's part of a continuous frame and we know well what is the end conditions if we have for example a continuous frame but the 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 girder is so huge so huge compared to the column and its stiffness is very high then we are going to say that this column as if it has fixed con condition Okay, as if it is fixed at the top. So this means that if we are having a well-defined end condition, then we can use it. The, then we can use this approximate value. In reality, actually, you're not going to find that something uh, or you're not going to find these uh, end conditions to be fully um, like acknowledged. Uh, you're going to find that always there is a debate about what is the right end condition to be used. Okay. Because we cannot, we cannot guarantee 100% it is going to be fixed or 100% is going to be like hinged like here, as we said before. Reality is always different, but this is considered to be an approximation that is going to provide you some conservative values and going to put you in the safe side. Okay. Okay. And commonly, whenever k, uh, whenever we are talking about it, the buckling length, so this is what what I have like mentioned here. If we are going to have hinged, hinged, the, the most famous, we can say these are the most famous in conditions that you can see. If we are going to talk about hinged, hinged, so this is the buckling length here. If we are going, which is going to be one, as we said. If we have like fixed free, this is also a very common case you're going to find buckling length is going to be double of the length because the buckling wave is going to be like double the length. Okay. Buckling length is going to be double. And if we have like fixed, fixed, so take it as 0.5, maybe we forgot the 0.5 here, so it's going to be 0.5. And if we have like pinned and fixed ends, then K is going to be 0.7. Uh, here, but anyway, if you want to be very accurate, you should use this table. Okay, you should use this table, table C dash C 2.2, and this is the accurate one and the most accurate if we are talking about approximation for the end conditions. Okay, now let's talk about something else which is related to the side sway permitted case. Side sway permitted effective length of columns in case of continuous structure where the side sway is permitted, okay, non-brazed frames, for example, like moment frames, as you can see, many cases we are having moment frames where that we do not have any bracings, and we have lateral loading here, okay, we have gravity loading, and we have lateral loading, so if you're going to talk about, if you're going to talk about one column here, for example, which is AB, for example, then you're going to find that the end condition is cannot be defined well. It is going to be defined based on the girders framing into it. And in the same time, because this structure is side sway permitted case, this means that whenever there is lateral loading, you're going to find this point is going to laterally move, right? That's right. So this is the first case, side sway permitted. The rotational restraint provided by the beams or girders at the end of a column is a function of the rotational stiffnesses of the members intersecting at the joint. That's right. We are having different rotational stiffnesses of the members. Okay. The rotational stiffness of a member is proportional to E over L, which is the Young's modulus over the length of the member where i is the moment of inertia of the cross section with respect to the uh, axis of bending 
so how we are going to find a way for for this how we can find like what is the end condition and how we can obtain k it is going to be problematic for us right so um, in 1992 there was uh, research by <clears throat> uh, by some researchers okay they show that the effective length factor k depends on the ratio of column stiffness to girder stiffness at each end of the member which can be expressed like this so we're going to use this word or this letter g capital g which is going to make or to give us the ratio between the sum of the stiffnesses of all columns at the end of the column under consideration this is the numerator and the denominator is going to be sum of stiffnesses of all girders at the end of the column under consideration if we are talking about the same material which is concrete or steel we are talking about steel here so we are like having a summation of sigma ic over lc over ig over lg okay so we are having this uh, this ratio okay we are having this ratio okay and this is ec and eg it is like e which is the modulus of elasticity of structure steel because we are talking about steel here and they are having the same young's models okay okay now whenever that we're talking about different like end conditions based on this ratio we are going to use what we call it the alignment chart k okay so if we go back here if we're talking about this a b which is here a b then we are going to use this alignment chart okay so the relationship between the k which is the uh, effective uh, length factor and g's which is g a and g b is based on this alignment chart we are having this is a very famous alignment chart based on jackson and moorland alignment chart okay in 1976 which are produced in this is different figures actually in the commentary you are going to find that a this is for side sway not prevented unbraced frame which is our case now i'm talking about it if you look to to this alignment chart you're going to find that point a is moving relative to point b laterally because this is like as we said side sway not prevented however the other case which is side sway prevented which is we are supposedly found it and raised frames we're going to find that the point a and point b they are not moving to one another they are not moving to one another they are like uh, only buckling off the column itself under like load so here we are having like delta some relative movement we have the force axial force and we have rotation as well but here we are under the braced condition we are assuming that there are some bracing that is going to control okay or they are connected at bracing at the end it is going to control the lateral movement we have theta only and we have the vertical force okay so this is the alignment chart we're going to put to put here ga starting from zero okay let's erase here this is ga which is starting from zero and ending with infinity and also for b it is starting from zero to infinity and in the middle we are going to find k which is starting from one and ending with like infinity which is 20 here because there is nothing more than this yes we are not to use of course this 20 we're not going to reach it but anyway what is interesting here for side sway not prevented whenever the side sway is there we are starting from one means that our k is always larger than one but if we are talking about braised frame where side sway prevented we are going to start with 0.5 always and we are going to limit it up until one okay so this is major difference between side sway prevented and side sway not uh, side sway prevented at side sway not 
prevented. Okay. Okay. Now again, we are under the title of like sites way not prevented. This is what we are talking about. Okay. So this means that we are going to get the K based on this alignment chart. We are going to look what is G A based on the summation of I over L for columns at this point. If we're talking about point A, and we are going to repeat the same process here at point B. Okay. I L over I L for columns over the summation of I L for girders at each point. And then we're going to, if it is here, we are going to like connect between the two, the value of G A and the value of G B. And then you are going to intersect the K axis with a point. This point is considered to be your K. Okay. So this is what we are having here. This is what we call it the alignment chart. Commonly, whenever that we have a hinged condition, so you are going to find G equals to 1. Okay. And if we are having the pin condition, then you are going to find that G equal to 10. So simply in order to make it making your life easier, whenever you have fixed end condition, G equals to 1. Whenever you have pin end condition, G equal to 10. Okay. This is for the alignment chart for the case of unbraised frames, or we can say sites way not prevented. Okay. And this is again, as I said, this is what we're going to do for G A and G B. G A and G B. We're going to calculate the summation of I over L for column over I over L for beams. This is for this point. And we are going to do the same, okay, here for this point. Then these two values are going to be used for uh, the align on the alignment chart in order to obtain the value of k. Okay, okay. Now till now it is it is very uh, good, and this is the common effective length KL for frames for side sway permitted. This is commonly used. It's a common like values as you can see always that these points they are relative to one another they are not going to uh to move okay wait please here okay so as you can see here this is yes this is the case i'm sorry this is the case here not all of them they are side sway permitted actually they are like we are having this these two cases they are side sway permitted because the point here and here they are moving to one another so we're going to find that kl is larger than 2 in this case here okay this is unbraised frame hinged base but if we have unbraised frame that is fixed base you are going to find that this point is moving toward this or relative to the bottom or the base and you are going to find that our kl is going to be in between l and 2l Okay, so this is hinged base, this is fixed base. However, for the uh, common effective length KL for frames, side sway not permitted. So again, this is side sway permitted for this case. But we have another case that I'm describing here, which is the brazed frame. This is the brazed frame. As you can see, the two points are not moving to one another. We have bracing here. So the K is going to be within one. Or less than one kl between 0.7 l and l if the base is hinged however if the base is fixed we are going to have the buckling length to be between 0.5 and 0.7 okay always whenever that we have the fixed base you are going to find that kl is going to be less than the hinged base okay now that's very nice and i think that we are ready now to go to the second part which is side sway not permitted or braised frame even that i have mentioned about some cases here i have i should have put these uh, these two cases actually here but anyway we understood it now so in this case the definition i want to highlight or place emphasis upon one thing here because this part actually i have like uh, taken it from uh, salman and johnson book because it's important also and written in asic in, in, in isc 
the definition of the braised frame. What is the meaning of braised frame? Because maybe we put braces, but they are not working properly. They are not adequate to provide the lateral support for the system that we are using, right? So we need to know what is the meaning of braised frame definition. So according to AISC C1.31, this is where you can find the definition, okay? The lateral bra bracing is, or the braised frame is, the one in which lateral, take care of the words here, lateral stability, lateral stability is provided by diagonal bracing, shear walls, or equivalent means. So we have like diagonal bracing. This is example of diagonal bracing here that you can see cross bracing here, okay, or something like this, or shear walls, okay, like shear walls like this, whether they are masonry or reinforced concrete or steel plate, whatever the type. So the vertical bracing system must be adequate. This is a key word here. Adequate means that we need to design here. Chapter 6, okay, is going to provide for us the design of stability bracing, as I'm going to talk about it later, especially for beams, as determined by structure analysis. To prevent buckling, buckling of structure and to maintain the lateral stability of the structure, including the overturning effects of drift under the factor loads, okay, this is what the word adequate means, to prevent buckling of the structure and to maintain lateral stability. So two things here that we need to take care of, which is prevent buckling okay, and lateral stability. Because if we are going to have lateral loads, sorry, let's go here. Yes, if we have like lateral loads, then the, the, the bracing is going to provide like support against these lateral loads. And in the same time, it should, it should provide the uh, stability for the ends of the element under consideration, I mean the column. Note that a vertical column in a braised frame would have no sideways movement of its top relative to its bottom. That's right. This means that this point should not move relative to this point. Okay? This is what we mean by adequate braised frame. Okay? And note about braised frame, we have two types of braised frame. Okay? So the braised frame must not resist only the tendency to sway under action of lateral loads, but also the tendency to buckle, as we said, lateral loads and buckling. Let's go back here to, to prevent buckling, as I said, and to provide lateral stability. That's very important. So here it is the same. We are going, or this bracing needs to, needs to provide uh, like stability against buckling, okay? or becoming unstable, and lateral loads as well. Bracing to stabilize a structure against vertical load is called stability bracing. Yes, we call this stability bracing. Bracing to stabilize structure against vertical loading. Take care, we're talking about vertical loading because whenever that we have vertical loading, let's go back here, for example, if we have like vertical loading, there is tendency, if the loading is unsymmetric, there are a tendency of this braised frame even to go laterally. Okay, it is going to move laterally. Okay, if we didn't provide this kind of lateral uh, lateral bracing, okay, the adequate lateral bracing. So if the loading is unsymmetric, then we're going to find that our structure is going to move laterally. So here bracing that is going to stabilize a structure again is vertical loading is called stability bracing stability bracing okay appendix six of the aisc specification stability bracing for columns and beams covers this type of bracing and we have two different types or categories relative and nodal so we have like two different types of uh, of stability bracing one called relative where that the bracing is connected to the elements themselves. This is a plan, by the way. This is the plan. So this is the column here. This is actually relative and nodal. This is, it is going to be explained in the beam chapter, but only I want to like provide to you an idea about what is the meaning of stability bracing. So we have like relative and nodal. The nodal means that the points are connected to 
rigid support, external rigid support. However, relative means that we are putting some relative bracing. So if we're going to talk about like the elements here, for example, yes, if we are talking, this is considered to be like relative bracings. But if I'm going to provide here something like this and here something like this, this is considered to be nodal bracing. Okay, effective length uh, of columns in case of continuous structure, side sway not permitted. This is the common one that we can say or we can see here. Always KL as can be shown always less than 1. I mean that K here. K is less than 1. Okay, because we have pen pen or fixed fixed or pen fixed or it is like uh, like in the in, in, a, in a continuous structure or frame, but it is braised braised frame. So we are going to find that our KL is always less than L, as you can see in all cases that we have. So this is the end rotation unrestrained. This is end rotation fully restrained in this case, and we have one end restrained, other unrestrained, which is uh, fixed here and hinged here and partially restrains at each end, which is this case. Okay, so I think that this is the like uh, the end of our uh, video for today. I hope that you have understood what I have explained uh, for today. Please, I think that the, the dose of information here is, is high and you need to go back and check what I have said uh, and try to stop the video at different uh times and try to do your um, assignment by yourself especially for the examples and go through the main ideas again thank you very much for listening and see you in the next video